when, before you started the project, what did you know about what happened there? I mean, I had seen a couple of movies, documentaries, um, and I basically had the take that everybody had. The Israeli military is infallible, the best military in the world. They get crazy things done that nobody else can do. That was the official uh, take on it and pretty much what I had. Um, then when I looked at it, when I read the screenplay and I saw uh, the work that Gregory Burke and had done, the writer, with Kate Salomon, who had done a lot of research. Then I read the book by Saul Davis, Professor Davis, who had researched this for many years and just published the book. I realized there was way more to this operation than meets the eye. I realized that the military success was contingent on things that were not military at all. They were very lucky. And then I realized that there was a gigantic political debate going on behind the scenes, whether to negotiate and not to negotiate, and that this debate had a meaning that transcended the movie um, and could be understood to enlighten things that are happening today. So then I said, yeah, let's do this movie. D did you set out to make a political movie? Uh, you know, this is a very interesting thing because I have no ideology. I'm a Brazilian person. I, I uh, don't um, want to stir the movie into this side or that side. So I basically set out to tell a story that happened in the real world. Now, the characters in the story have political perspectives. For me to establish a character, even in the context of uh, drama, what is drama? Drama is conflict. How do you establish it? You tell, you tell your audience what the character wants and why, and then you show what stops it, him from getting it. So just by doing that, if I explain to you that the Palestinian um, hijackers have a personal stake on this, they, are, they have family members that have been killed by Israeli soldiers, they are... Um, in the middle of a conflict and they uh, want to have their comrades released in Israel. So they, they are going into this with their own rationale. They think uh, that uh, what Israel has done to the Palestine is similar to what the Germans had done to Israel back then. And that's what's said in the movie. Uh, so I understand that. I understand the internal logic of that character. Then I look at Bozzi and Brigitte and they are doing it for the left. They are doing it for Marxism. A total different set of reasons it's ideology at play. And I get what they're doing and I understand where they're coming from. Then I get the hostages perspective. Jacques Lemoyne, right? He goes and, oh, you, ha you guys have all these reasons, but you're going to kill innocent people for that? And I totally understand that. And it disarms the other guy's arguments. And that's his logic. I have the logic of Shimon Peres. Let's not negotiate. It's better if everybody dies. That's what Kissinger says. And I agree with it. And absolutely true. Kissinger made that call. Uh, and I look at uh, Isaac Rabin, and uh, he is dreadful that these people will die. He doesn't really believe that this military operation will succeed, and he wants to try to come to some sort of deal. So just by presenting that, I cannot escape uh, making a movie that has a political uh, content, because all those characters are political. That doesn't mean that I am political, though I am, but... I am political in relation to the government of Brazil. <laughs> no, but what you're explaining in a very good way is how confusing the world is. And there is no difference between then and now. Yes. Uh, the militaristic perspective of this event is a gigantic oversimplification. You can ask why. Why is this oversimplified? And, and then you can get a sort of a many nationalistic you know, tendencies in Israel. This is the story of Yoni Netanyahu, the hero. Uh, and it is the story of Yoni Netanyahu, the hero. A little bit, not all of it. Uh, and so, you know, um, his brother is prime minister and he, you know, benefited a lot from this uh, characterization, the military thing. And so you understand why people don't see it in all its complexity. There are different agendas on different uh, parties narrating this. Um, so yes, we try to regain some of the complexity of what happened. Now, can I have all the complexity in a movie? No, I can't. History is so complicated. There are so many parts. There's the Kenyan government and what happened in Kenya afterwards. There is the French government uh, and what they did. There's the Germans and what they said. So I can't put all of that in the movie. So I, I, 
I tried to keep the complexity, uh, but I didn't overdo it because otherwise it would have to be a Netflix series. That is the other question, because what you did is basically directing an entertaining movie with all these co complex elements in it. So how did you how did you find the right tone, the right pacing right. To, to, to reach out to a gro bigger audience? I suppose this is why they, um, Tim Bevan invited me to do this. Um, I never had this conversation with him, so I don't know. But, uh, but you know, the, from the beginning, the idea was let's take a bird's eye point of view. Let's put all the key characters at play and let the drama roll out the way it did. Go into the research, seeing what happened, and tell the story based from this point of view. So I am the right guy to do this because I'm Brazilian and I, I, I don't have any other point of view other than the bird's eye point of view on this. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, once you get that, you have to do two things. You have to tell a story that is factually consistent because this is a true story. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make it work as a movie, which means that you have to find the correct uh, dramatic way to tell it that, it's, um, that will grab an audience. And so we, I thought, immediately I thought thriller. This is a thriller. Uh, I don't know, the stakes are really high. Uh, there is always the, the danger that somebody will be killed any second because there's people pointing guns at other people. Uh, and there is um, the final, the showdown at the end. So it's, very, it's kind of fairly obvious the way to structure it. it um, two parallel stories. Uh, in which you know you have the drama of the hijackers and the hostages, you have the political scenario where the Israeli cabinet is debating what to do, and this is and there is a ticking clock, tick 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 tick. Something has to happen before seven days. Um, it's hard to make this movie without making a thriller. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great. I mean, yeah, it's awesome because I want my movie to be seen. The movie has. Um, uh, it has a political, I wouldn't even say political, it has a sociological perspective in in it, which is there are constraints for politicians in Israel and politicians in Palestine to negotiate. Very hard for a politician in Israel to negotiate without losing his political standing. Why? There is a conflict. And in the context of this conflict, many politicians and many parties raised to prominence by saying, I am going to defend you from your enemy. And the moment you frame the other side as the enemy, it's very hard for you to backpedal into negotiation. You negotiate, you lose votes, period. You lose political support. And this is true of Israel. You see in the movie that Rabin is like, he thinks he has to negotiate, but he can't get himself to do it because it's going to kill him. Then on the other, it's also true of the Palestinians. Like if you look at, and this is not the movie, but you look at Camp David. Ehud Barak was prime minister. He proposed a deal that uh, could, could have been the roadmap to peace. And, and uh, Bill Clinton was intermediating between Arafat and Barak. Uh, and Bill Clinton said all Arafat could say was no. Even if he knew that the deal was good, he would say no, because if he said yes, he wouldn't control politics in, in Palestine. So that is implicit in the movie. And that's why this uh, conflict is ongoing, and it's very hard to solve. Now, the two characters, the two actors that you chose to play the main parts, you need a certain kind of actor, right, to play this good. The, in yeah, the right yeah. Way. The the kind the, the kind is the good actor, the great actor. That's what I need. <laughs> well, you would never uh, cast a bad actor, I guess. Yes. So you always go yes. for a great actor. Yeah, that's but true. I mean, I mean, do they need to have courage in a way to do this? Um, you know, funny enough, the, as soon as I read the screenplay, I thought Daniel Brew. I have followed Daniel's career since Goodbye Lenin. He's been involved in movies that have to do with Marxism, so he knows what this is about. He is German, he speaks German, he's a natural language. Uh, so I went out to Daniel when he said, yes, I want to do it. And so um, that was that. Then how do I find Brigitta? I need somebody who has um, standing to put this movie together. Um, someone who's an incredible actress and someone who can speak German. And so I met many actresses and I met Rosemann and I asked her, so we are 
can you speak German? She goes like, no, but I'll do it. I go like, what do you mean? I'll learn it phonetically and it's going to be perfect and I'll deliver the acting while saying those words that I don't know what they mean. And I go like, will you? She goes, yes. And I said, okay, let's do it. So she hired a person to prepare her and they worked really hard on it. And now every single German person that looks at the movie tells me that it's perfect German. Even the Frankfurt accent that Brigitta had, she repeated it. So very lucky. Now the, the one role that was harder to cast that had to do with courage was Shimon Peres. Because I had casted Lior Eskenazi, who is Israeli, uh, to play Rabin. It was actually a suggestion of Yuval Ir Rabin, Isaac Rabin's son. Uh, and he's a great actor. So he was Israeli. So whenever I approached an American Jewish actor to do um, Shimon Peres, they got afraid. Wait a second, the other guy is Israeli. And, I, <coughs> and then finally I go like, you know what, I'm just going to go for a guy who I think is a genius. So I met Eddie Martian. And I go like, do you want to play Shimon Peres? He go, like, yeah, hell yes, I want to do it. And so that's it. <laughs> he had no fear whatsoever. Uh, other actors had. And they had no fear to play a political in a political story. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we can't fear politics. I mean, if the cinema cannot be afraid of politics, um, it cannot be afraid of violence, and it cannot be afraid of sex. It can't because those things are part of life. Um, and by the way, I didn't say that. I'm just quoting Stanley Kubrick. 